Okay, so uh, today it's it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Melanie Shears. Uh, Melanie is an acting instructor um, here uh, in the Murphy Lab. Um, so Melanie comes from us all the way from Australia, uh, and, and where uh, she she got the the bug, as they say, to to study uh, malaria pretty early on, just right out of undergrad. She did some an honors thesis in malaria and has actually been studying it ever since. Uh, so she went and got her PhD at the University of Melbourne and then jumped all the way across the opposite side of the world and did a postdoc at, at uh, Johns Hopkins, again, studying more malaria. And then before moving over to Sean Murphy's lab where like I said, she's now an acting instructor uh, studying malaria. Uh, and so she's, uh, in an effort to to kind of uh, highlight what I you know, consider kind of rising stars in the in the department, and uh, in, in an effort to kind of get uh, junior faculty in front of the, the department, uh, I asked her to to give this talk. Um, and I consider you know she's on the right trajectory. She's already got herself in R twenty one of her very own, which is a big deal, especially for an acting position. Uh, so I think this portends good things for her. So uh, with that, uh, let's hear about malaria. Thank you very much. That was a, a lovely uh, introduction. Uh, let me just make this go full screen. Okay, is that all looking good for everybody? Looks good. All right. So let's jump right into it. Uh, I am going to begin with an introduction to the burden of malaria uh, and the malaria vaccine development pipeline. I'll then touch on malaria research in non-human primates in general and the role that they have to play in vaccine development. I'll then describe the rationale for bringing non-human primate malaria research to the University of Washington um, and then provide an overview of some of the work we've been doing in the last five years uh, in our non-human primate malaria research program. So first of all, to describe the global burden of malaria, malaria currently occurs in 85 countries around the world. Um, and it occurs in every geographical region except the WHO Europe region. Last year, there were an estimated 240 million cases and over 600,000 malaria deaths. And although this is a global disease, uh, the African continent is certainly hit the hardest with 96% of all malaria deaths occurring in Africa and 95% of all malaria cases occurring in Africa. Uh, and most of this burden is unfortunately uh, is unfortunately affecting infants and children um, under the age of five years. Malaria is caused by parasites of the genus Plasmodium, and there are several species that are able to infect humans, uh, but the most deadly is Plasmodium falciparum. The parasite has a very complex life cycle involving multiple stages in both the mosquito vector and the human host. And there's a simplified diagram here showing the key stages that are gonna be relevant for the talk today. The mosquito vector carries transmission stages called sporozoites, which are inoculated into the skin when a mosquito takes a bite meal, blood meal. Uh, these sporozoites exit the bite site uh, and travel through the skin and then the circulation to the liver where they establish a liver stage infection. This liver stage infection um, is very replicative um, and one sporozoite can give rise to thousands or tens of thousands of daughter parasites. Um, and it takes place in around seven days. Thereafter, parasites exit the liver and enter the blood and uh, have cycles of blood stage infection that gives rise to the symptoms of malaria, such as anemia, fevers, and chills. And in the blood, additional stages called gametocytes are produced, which can be transmitted back to mosquitoes and complete the life cycle. So the sporozoite and the liver stage are absolutely required for the parasite to establish an infection in the host but these are completely clinically silent. So an individual does not know that they're infected with malaria with these stages. And it's only when the parasite emerges into the blood uh, that we see the symptoms of malaria. So because of its immense global burden, there have been decades of effort to develop an effective malaria vaccine. Many of the vaccine strategies that have been considered aim to block the sporozoites or the liver stages. And the rationale is that if we're able to induce a protective immune response, 
that can stop the sporozoites from getting into the liver or from the liver stage parasites from developing, then we're going to be able to completely block the establishment of infection uh, and therefore prevent any of the symptoms or onward transmission of the disease. And we are now living in a world where we have the first ever approved malaria vaccine. This vaccine is called RTSS, formulated with the AS01 adjuvant, and it was approved by the WHO last year for use in areas of high Plasmodium falciparum malaria transmission. This is an important milestone, um, and this vaccine is going to be a very useful tool in combating malaria, but unfortunately it only shows modest efficacy against severe disease. And so in the target population of infants and children, it provides between 30 and 50% protection against severe disease. But it does not prevent infection. Um, so it does not, uh, in addition to not protecting all individuals, um, it's also unclear how much it will be able to contribute to preventing onward transmission. So we do still need a more improved and more effective malaria vaccine. So let's talk about the malaria vaccine development pipeline. We're very lucky in that we have a rodent model of malaria that provides a very convenient system for basic research. We actually have a couple of malaria parasite species that are infectious to rodents um, and can be used to infect uh, common laboratory mice. These parasites are quite different from the human malaria parasites, but they do have many conserved elements of their biology. So they can be useful for proof of principle studies, uh, for example, in validating vaccine antigens or in uh, different vaccine delivery platforms. So many folks have done basic research or uh, discovery research in these rodent malaria models uh, and then tested their vaccine candidate products um, in humans. And again, we're very lucky in the malaria field um, that we have uh, a controlled human malaria infection model. So this is where human volunteers would come to a clinic. They would be provided with a uh, experimental vaccine or drug treatment, and then they would be challenged with malaria parasites and monitored to see if that treatment were effective. And that is a great tool that has uh, enabled us to, to study vaccines and other interventions. Unfortunately, uh, what we've seen again and again is that discoveries that are made in the mouse models don't necessarily translate to the human system. Uh, and we've had many promising candidates that have shown very high degrees of protection in the mouse model and these have ultimately not been protected, uh, been protective when we've taken them to humans. And this can potentially arise from a couple of different reasons. Uh, the first is that the mouse uh, is not the same as a human. Uh, we share around 70% of our genome uh, with mice. And so while there are many common factors, there are, of course, uh, important differences between the immune systems of mice and humans. And there are also differences at the parasite level. So with uh, the rodent malaria parasites I mentioned, they're different species to what infects humans. And they're in fact millions of years diverged from the parasites that infect humans. And so while they are a useful model, uh, we do have these limitations in translating findings from the mouse into effective vaccines for humans. And so this is where non-human primates can play a role. Non-human primates are much more closely related to humans, so their immune systems and physiology is much more similar to ours. And in addition, they can be infected either with primate malaria parasites, which are much more closely related to human malaria parasites, or in some cases with the same parasites that infect humans. So they can provide a nice way to bridge the gap between the studies in mice and the studies in humans, and hopefully increase the chances that our vaccine candidates are going to be protective in the human populations. So now let's talk a little bit more about what these non-human primate research models are. There are in fact many different non-human primate research models that are used for malaria vaccine research. And these differ both in the choice of the non-human primate host, uh, where we can have a range of old world or new world monkey species, um, or in the choice of the malaria parasite. Um, and there are several uh, different malaria parasites that can be used to infect uh, various non-human primates. Um, but for simplicity and for today, I'm going to focus on macaque malaria models. Um, and that's because they are really one of the most commonly used host species, uh, and in particular rhesus macaques. And this is because macaques are 
closely related to humans. They share around 93% of their genome with humans. And they're the most closely related non-human primate species that are available for research. In the past, we've been able to do research uh, in uh, higher uh, apes, such as chimpanzees and gorillas, uh, that are even more closely related and share 98% of their genome with humans. But those animals are uh, no longer permitted to be used in a research setting um, because we recognize that they're very intelligent and uh, require very special care um, and really shouldn't be, be used in a research setting. So rhesus macaques and other macaques are really the next, next best option um, that we have for translational malaria vaccine studies. And as I mentioned earlier, um, these are a great option because they can either be infected with macaque parasites that are closely related to human parasites, or in some cases, the human parasites themselves. Um, and there are, uh, is there is increasing realization that many of the macaque parasites do actually infect humans in the wild as well. And we're seeing more and more cases of zoonotic infections um, with multiple macaque parasites spilling over into humans um, in certain forested settings in the wild. So that further improves the relevance and interest in studying these macaque parasites in their natural host. I also want to talk about some of the contributions that these models have made in the past. And just to touch on a couple of highlights, uh, I've already mentioned the RTSS vaccine that we now have. And I wanted to highlight that macaques played an important role in choosing the adjuvant for that vaccine. Um, and so uh, they uh, tested some different adjuvant formulations. They were initially going to go with an adjuvant called ASO2, but then they did these studies in non-human primates and in rhesus macaques in particular, um, and were able to show that the uh, adjuvant that we're now using, ASO1, was superior to ASO2. Um, so macaques were important for guiding the final formulation of the, the approved vaccine. Rhesus macaques have also been very important for underscoring the protective capability of live attenuated parasite vaccines. This was first shown in the 1970s, but in many studies since, um, that whole attenuated parasites um, of Plasmodium nolzi, a macaque uh, species of parasite, um, can confer complete sterile protection. So not just prevent against disease, but actually prevent the uh, establishment of a liver stage infection. Um, and that has led to the development of a suite of attenuated parasite vaccines that have now been tested in phase one, two, and three uh, human clinical trials. So that's the broad background. Let's now talk about specifically why we wanted to bring these models to the University of Washington. My mentor, Sean Murphy, uh, has an impressive uh, research group um, and research interests spanning many different areas. So uh, the group is interested in vaccine research uh, and uses rodent malaria models to study vaccine antigens and vaccine candidates. Sean is also an investigator in the Seattle Malaria Clinical Trial Center, performing controlled human malaria infection studies um, to assess vaccines and investigational drugs for malaria. And Sean also runs a clinical diagnostic lab uh, where uh, the group is able to uh, diagnose malaria in travelers or more commonly, because malaria in travelers in the US is not that common, um, to perform clinical diagnostics in support of these controlled human malaria infection studies. So that the individuals who come in and volunteer to get a vaccine and they get challenged, um, they can be monitored in real time and any individuals who fail to be protected by the vaccine um, can have their malaria diagnosed and rapidly treated um, using the, the assays um, in Sean's lab. So uh, this was the research interest uh, as of uh, 2018 when I joined the lab. But there was a really natural opportunity to add a translational non-human primate um, to this uh, research group. Um, and what that would enable us to do would be to have end-to-end -end capabilities to go from the mouse model through the monkey into controlled human malaria infections, where we do the diagnostics, um, and really uh, be, av be available to, to take our own vaccines through this entire pipeline, uh, but also to collaborate with others and to uh, get more vaccines uh, into our, um, the Malaria Clinical Trial Center. A further advantage of this was, would be that we'd be able to use some of the same diagnostic methods that are applied for humans 
um, and use them for the monkey trials to further improve the, the rigor and the uh, translational relevance of our monkey trial data. So those were the goals when I arrived in 2018 to establish the capability for macaque malaria studies at the University of Washington, to advance promising vaccine candidates um, that the Murphy group had previously identified in mice um, into non-human primates and hopefully eventually into humans. Uh, and then since I uh, you know, had already completed my PhD and postdoc, uh, to also further develop my malaria expertise uh, and to advance my independent career. So that's the uh, intro. I'm now going to go into uh, the real uh, data part of the talk. So I'm going to go through what we've done in the past five years to, to build up from zero malaria studies to many malaria studies. Uh, and I'm briefly going to break this down into these four sections. So I'm going to talk about how we laid the foundation for success. I'm going to talk about testing that homegrown malaria vaccine strategy that had been developed in the Murphy lab going to touch on academic and industry partnerships that we've cultivated that are supporting us in this endeavor. And then I'm going to end by describing some work that I'm leading to develop new and improved non-human primate research models. So first, for the foundations, what did we want to do? We wanted to be able to do a couple of different types of non-human primate studies. The first of these and the simplest of these is an immunogenicity study. So this is where we take some animals, we collect some baseline samples, we give them a vaccine treatment, uh, and then we would take uh, replete, repeated blood samples uh, or possibly tissue samples to assess the immune responses to that vaccine over time. Uh, and this is uh, quite a simple study design, um, but it can be useful as a very first place to start out when you're uh, first advancing a vaccine from mice into non-human primates. Complementing this, we'd want to do the more involved immunogenicity and efficacy studies. So these are now more mirroring the controlled human malaria infection studies, but with some additional parts that we can only do in monkeys. So again, we would take some baseline samples, we would give the vaccine treatment, and we'd continue to take blood to monitor the immune response in the periphery. Uh, but a unique feature of the non-human primates is that we can do tissue biopsies to also study the cellular immune responses to vaccination. Uh, and then we'd be able to do a challenge, um, monitor um, the animals after challenge to see if they develop an infection or are protected from by virtue of that vaccine. And ideally correlate protection uh, with the immune responses that we see in the blood or in the tissues. And then any animals that failed to be protected could be drug cured before being returned to the colony. So we're very fortunate to have the Washington National Primate Research Center uh, here on campus at the uh, University of Washington Medical Center. And they have an excellent research team uh, that uh, is very experienced in vaccine studies and in animal handling and for the things that lots of other folks would want to do for biomedical research in macaques, including routine blood, routine blood draws and routine tissue biopsies. What we didn't have, however, was much experience with these malaria specific methods. Um, there had been a little bit of malaria research in the past at our primate center, but unfortunately the folks who were involved in that research had, had largely moved on. And so there was no contemporary knowledge to support us uh, in these studies. So we had to start from scratch and uh, make sure that we could do all of these basic things um, in order to enable um, the types of studies that we wanted to do and particularly the challenge studies. So we needed to get our methods for sporozoic challenge up and running. We needed to have methods for daily blood sampling in order to monitor if animals are protected after challenge. We needed to make sure that our diagnostic tools would work. Uh, and we also needed to make sure that we could uh, safely treat our animals so that they didn't suffer any symptoms of malaria. So I'm going to go through each of those now and talk about how we laid these foundations. So the very first thing um, is sporozoic challenge. And in the literature, both human and macaque malaria parasites have been used for vaccine research. Uh, and particularly there are key studies that have been performed using plasmodium nolsi, which is a, a macaque adapted parasite or Plasmodium falciparum, which is the main human parasite. 
And we wanted to uh, emulate these studies and, and build from these studies. Um, but very interestingly, um, the macaque adapted parasite, Plasmodium nolsi, it's fully infectious in macaques. It can undergo all life stages in a macaque. And so that's uh, illustrated by this outer circle of arrows here. Whereas the Plasmodium falciparum parasite is human adapted um, and is known to not be able to invade macaque red blood cells. There's a, a host um, barrier um, that prevents the parasite from invading the macaque uh, red blood cells. However, that human malaria parasite is still able to uh, have infectious sporozoites that go into the macaque liver. And so there had been some really key studies that had been done using this human malaria parasite in the macaque, um, studying vaccines that could block that sporozoite to liver stage transition. And so we wanted to know which, which type of challenge and which type of uh, endpoint assay we were going to use. And specifically, if we were going to use the human parasite, which might be more relevant, um, and have a liver RT-PCR endpoint, similar to what's done in rodent malaria studies, or whether we wanted to use the macaque adapted parasite that might be a little further away from the, the parasite that is the main concern in humans, um, but which would enable us to do controlled human malaria infection style studies uh, where we'd have a challenge followed by a blood smear endpoint. And so one of the first activities that we did um, was to work out what happens when we put these parasites into rhesus macaques. The prior literature that we were drawing from had surprisingly never done a head-to-head -head comparison of these two parasites in the rhesus macaque. Groups had either used the falciparum model in isolation or they had used the nolzai model in isolation, but there had not been a head-to-head -head comparison. And so we wanted to do an in vivo comparison and work out really how fit are the parasites of the human uh, infectious species in the macaque? And is that going to be useful for us for vaccine studies or not? So for this, we designed a really simple experiment where we took naive rhesus macaques and we challenged them with sporozoites of either the human infectious species, Plasmodium falciparum, or the macaque adapted species, Plasmodium nolsi. And then five days later, at the peak of the liver stage, sampled the liver for 18S RNA RT-PCR to uh, quantify the amount of parasite in the liver. And the results are shown here. So we have six animals, four animals received falciparum. You can see PF1 and 2, they received a lower dose. PF3 and 4 received a higher dose, um, whereas two animals received null eye parasites named PK1 and 2. For the animals that received the falciparum, regardless of the dose, we saw um, a lot of tissue sites that didn't have any parasites at all. Um, and we also saw some variability um, in the infection uh, success in different animals. So you can see in the animal PF1, we actually didn't detect any infection at all. Um, whereas in the other three animals, we did see some levels of infection. In comparison, in the animals that received the macaque adapted parasites, we saw consistent high level infection. And what we wanted to do is work out if these are naive animals, can we achieve a reliable baseline infection level so that when we have a vaccination, we can then see a decrease um, and, and use that to measure vaccine efficacy. And what this really told us was we can't do that with falciparum. The infections are not reliable enough and the infections are too variable in the macaque host. We really need to use the macaque adapted nolzite parasite um, that gives us consistent, reliable infections, high burden infections, so that then we can see a separation between groups between naive and vaccine. So that was our first key finding that for challenge studies, we should really be using the nolzite parasite, which would enable um, a, uh, either a liver or a blood stage endpoint. Knowing that we wanted to use the plasmodium nolze model for our challenge studies, we next wanted to optimize the challenge dose. And again, for this, we designed a really simple experiment. Uh, we took groups of macaques and we challenged them with varying doses of the nolzai sporozoites and monitored their time to a blood stage infection by both blood smear or the uh, same clinical diagnostic assay, the 18S RNA RT-PCR assay as used in controlled human malaria infection studies and just see how reproducible infections were with in naive animals at different doses. 
Here we have some data from rhesus macaques. Starting with a low challenge dose of 500, we saw that all three animals became positive, but there was quite a spread in the time to positivity with one animal coming positive on day nine, one on day 11, and another on day 12. So uh, we then looked at the next dose, 2,500. Uh, and in this case, we now saw all animals becoming positive on the same day, uh, on day 10. Um, so this was uh, very encouraging that we were seeing reproducible infections at this challenge dose. We also looked at higher challenge doses, 12,500 and 2,500. Um, and we saw that as we increased the dose, the time to detection of parasites by blood smear um, becomes shorter. Um, but we elected not to use these higher doses because the, we wanted to replicate what was normally happening uh, when a mosquito bites. Uh, and a mosquito bite is only estimated to deliver hundreds to perhaps a few thousand parasites. So we ended up settling on 2,500 as the ideal dose where we got reproducible infections, but we don't have an incredibly high or an artificially high um, challenge inoculum. We also repeated this for the pigtailed macaque. This is actually our favorite macaque species and it's the, the species that we breed mostly at the Washington National Primate Research Center. And so we replicated this with the challenge dose of 2,500 in three more macaques. Um, and in uh, these animals, they all became positive on day 11. And so uh, this was really encouraging and confirming uh, to us that we could use this challenge dose of 2,500 in either macaque species um, for our future challenge studies. We went on and uh, repeated some uh, with another group of uh, pigtailed macaques to increase our sample size. And here now you can see the time to infection in naive pigtailed macaques after challenge with 2,500 sporozoites, uh, time to detection by either the RT-PCR method or the blood smear method. Um, and you can see uh, we're seeing a tiny bit more spread now that we have more animals, um, but we have very reproducible time to infection by both methods. And as has been reported in controlled human malaria infection studies, we're reliably detecting the parasites by RT-PCR several days ahead of when we detect them by blood smear. Um, and so that was another really nice piece of data that was again mi mirroring what had been reported in controlled human malaria infection studies. Now that we had the challenge parasite and the challenge dose worked out, uh, we needed to find ways to sample blood daily from these animals in order to measure vaccine efficacy post-challenge. The option that was available at the Primate Center was to use a permanently attached intravenous catheter um, called a tether. Um, this is a catheter that is implanted either through the armpit or the groin, and it um, goes through to the um, vena cava um, and then has a lead that is, um, comes out of the body through a port and is held in place through a jacket. And this permits large volume blood draws from awake animals um, without the need to sedate them. Um, so um, you can take blood from animals at a reasonable frequency with sedated blood draws, um, but you can't do that every day because you must fast the animals prior to sedation um, so that they don't um, throw up any food or aspirate any um, food um, while they're going under and waking up. And so it's just not um, ethical or feasible to, to sedate them for blood draws every day. Um, and so this was proposed as the alternative. And this could probably have worked, um, but this obviously requires a surgery um, and it requires restraining the animals with this jacket. Um, and this was also actually more developed for large volume blood, blood draws and not for the small volume blood draws that we wanted for malaria diagnosis. So we thought we should probably try and find an alternative. And so we looked into the literature and we chatted to, to some other primate centers and we decided that we should look into cooperative me methods of blood sampling. So this is rather than physically restraining the animal, rather than sedating the animal, you train it to voluntarily participate in a blood sampling procedure uh, for a food reward. So uh, what we do with these animals is we um, give them marshmallows or dried apples or dried apricots or whatever their favorite food is. And we encourage them to uh, put their heel out through the cage and to um, tolerate a very brief stick um, with a little lancet. 
you can imagine something like a diabetic lancet uh, is, is the this kind of the short sharp poke. And then they get a drop or two of blood and we're able to collect that onto a blood spot card. Uh, and that is sufficient for malaria diagnosis. So this is really nice. Uh, it's much nicer for the animals. Uh, we're not taking more blood than we need to. We're not restraining them. Uh, and we're not having to remove their food to, uh, in order to sedate them. We're in fact able to give them extra treats. So um, this is a really nice refinement. And so we um, have been doing this with pigtail macaques now for a couple of studies. We did an initial pilot study, uh, study one and two in naive animals, just checking uh, that they would allow us to collect from them repeatedly every day. And we saw 75% uh, compliance in our first attempt and then we're able to bring that up to 100% compliance uh, in our second attempt. And so that means every animal turned up every day and enabled us to take a blood sample uh, for 14 days. So that was a really great thing to achieve. And with this now working, uh, and we have a current study, study three underway with six animals, uh, which is a vaccination and challenge study where we're gonna be doing this uh, repeated daily voluntary blood sampling. And we're really excited to see the results from that. So the next thing, now that we can collect the blood, uh, we have to make sure that it's appropriate for uh, the diagnostic assay that we want to apply. And dried blood spots are definitely convenient, um, but they do come with some limitations. Um, and really it's just that the, the sample volume is more variable. So. When you get a blood drop, you know, you're touching a card to a drop of blood on the heel of the animal. Maybe not all of it will go in a circle. Maybe you smear a little bit, maybe drops are bigger one day than the next day. It's just a little bit more sample variability that we have to deal with. Compared to if we have a venous blood draw where we can just pipette out exactly the 50 microliters that we want each day for the test. We just had to confirm that this convenient sampling method uh, was, was gonna be okay from a, a diagnostic endpoint. And so for a number of studies, we collected matched samples by each method uh, and then uh, compared the 18S RNA RT-PCR outputs to see if uh, we were getting similar results. And briefly, um, the cooperative sampling uh, compared to the sedated blood draw, we looked uh, not only at the RT-PCR data, but also other factors such as how easy it was to transport or how stable the samples were. We found that the blood spot cards were really uh, very convenient because the blood dried very quickly. You didn't have to then transport a liquid sample. You could transport this dried sample, um, which was easier. The blood spot cards also preserve DNA and RNA. Uh, and so they can be stored for quite an extended period of time. And you can, for example, if we have to do the sampling over a weekend, they can be collected at the primate center over the weekend. We can pick them up on Monday and they're still perfectly fine versus blood, we have to process on the same day. Um, so this gives us some more flexibility uh, using the blood spot cards in, in terms of sample stability. Looking at the sensitivity, it wasn't quite as good uh, at the very low end of the uh, assay, right near the limit of detection. We were seeing some losses in sensitivity with the blood spot collection method, uh, but actually we determined that this was a very minor compromise and that overall, um, going with the blood spot cards was going to be, uh, was going to be a better choice um, and still provide us with excellent quality data. Going on now to drug cure, uh, we wanted to make sure that we could cure any of our non-protected animals so that they could be safely returned to the colony. And uh, in the literature, Drugs are commonly described in the methods, but not with very much detail. Uh, it's very common for it to say in the methods, you know, macaques were treated with oral chloroquine daily. <laughs> you know, that uh, more information would have been beneficial. So we, um, we tried oral chloroquine uh, in food. You may know that chloroquine is related to quinine, which is the bitter substance in tonic water. And what we found is when we gave this to the animals in food, even if it was mixed with delicious fruit purees or puddings, it was still too bitter and the animals would often reject it. So animals would fail treatment um, and then we'd have to resort to oral gavage. 
And so oral gavage, you have to sedate the animal, fast the animal, sedate the animal, put a nasogastric tube um, and then um, put it in manually. And so this really wasn't ideal. We wanted to avoid doing that if possible. Um, and so we sought to refine methods for oral drug treatment in the infected animals. And we ended up finding a great uh, alternative. Um, there is a relatively inexpensive drug called Coatum. Uh, this is a combination drug that contains a long acting and a short acting partner, and uh, it is not bitter. So uh, this drug was very well tolerated in the food and uh, we were able and because it has a long acting partner, if by chance the animals didn't eat one dose, um, that wouldn't compromise the entire uh, treatment regime. And, and we found this to be very effective. So for the foundations, um, we were able to show that we should use macaque parasites for our challenge studies. We were able to define the optimal sporozoic challenge dose with that parasite, refine methods for daily sampling, identify the most appropriate sample type of the dry blood spots um, for our diagnosis, and then also make sure that we could uh, successfully and easily treat these animals with anti-malarial drugs. Alrighty, so moving along uh, to testing our homegrown malaria vaccine. With these foundations in place, we now wanted to test the vaccine that had been developed in the Murphy lab and tested in mice. So the vaccine is called a prime and trap vaccine. And this is a heterologous two-step strategy designed to induce protective immune responses in the liver. The two steps are as follows. There is a priming step where DNA encoding the sporozoite antigen known as CSP um, is provided. Uh, this antigen CSP is the basis of the RTSS malaria vaccine. Um, and is also one of the most uh, well-studied uh, malaria antigens known. So we primed with a single antigen by delivering DNA encoding CSP into the skin. And then 28 days later, the animals were given a single dose of attenuated sporozoites. So uh, these attenuated sporozoites are able to invade the liver. They're able to deliver and express antigen and they abundantly express the CSP protein. Um, so that boosts the CSP specific responses. But then the parasites die in the liver. So they never go on to uh, cause disease. And so this two step approach, it kind of combines the best elements of a subunit vaccine and a whole organism vaccine. Uh, and it is able to uh, be potently immunogenic and protective in the mouse model. So in uh, prior data and more recent data from the Murphy lab, they were able to show that this prime and trap response, prime and trap vaccine in the rodent malaria model could provide between 90 to 100% protection and could induce a uh, robust liver specific uh, CD8 T cell memory responses, which were the desired uh, type of T cell response that are predicted to correlate with durable sterile protection from malaria vaccination. So we wanted to test this vaccine uh, in the non-human primate model. And for the first study, we decided to go for a immunogenicity study where we would take the prime trap vaccine, uh, now encoding the Plasmodium falciparum uh, CSP antigen. We would prime these animals. We then deliver a single dose of the irradiated uh, Plasmodium falciparum sporozoites to boost and trap those responses in the liver. And then in addition to taking blood, we would also take a liver sample to assess the induction of CD8 T cells in the target organ of the liver. We can see the results here of the immunogenicity analyses. Uh, this is results from an ELI spot um, with stimulation with the PFCSP peptide. And the study design had three groups of animals. We had mock vaccinated animals, we had prime and trap vaccinated animals, and then we had three additional animals that just received the attenuated sporozoite trap only. And what you can see is that two of the three animals in the prime and trap group made detectable uh, cellular responses in the liver, uh, confirming that we were likely inducing the response that we wanted. 
Um, we also saw that in the PBMCs or the peripheral blood mononucleosides um, that we're also able to see a detectable response. So this suggested that prime and trap could be immunogenic uh, in a non-human primate model, uh, but probably that we needed uh, a bit more tweaking with this vaccine strategy uh, in order to uh, achieve high levels of immunogenicity and hopefully protection um, in all animals. So for the next study, we did an immunogenicity and efficacy study. And to improve the vaccine and to try and make it immunogenic in all animals, we added additional antigens. And so we didn't just prime with DNA encoding CSP, we primed with a three antigen cocktail uh, and then followed with a now nullzy sporozoic trap uh, before doing a nullzy challenge uh, and efficacy assessment. Uh, and what we found was that all animals responded to at least one antigen. So here we have the same type of data, the uh, alley spot with the uh, peptide stimulation to measure cellular responses, this time in the PBM6. And we have our uh, three animals here. And we saw that one animal made very robust responses to the CSP antigen. We saw that all animals made responses to the TRAP antigen. This is the second most well-studied malaria parasite antigen. And it's also been the focus of many vaccines that have gone into clinical trials. And our third antigen, we saw two of three animals respond to. And this antigen is called RPL6, and it's a more newly described antigen that's gaining interest in the literature. After the challenge, what we found was that the animal that responded to all three antigens was completely protected. And so it never went on to develop an infection. It was sterile protection, which was the goal. We saw the one other animal that responded predominantly to the CSP antigen showed a delay in time to infection, uh, indicating partial protection. Uh, and so, and the other animal, unfortunately, um, did not show any evidence of protection. So while this is probably uh, an improvement um, over our initial study, uh, we uh, still need to do further work to refine this primary trap vaccine strategy um, before we advance this into human clinical trials. And we've already undertaken uh, some work in that area, and we have another study with the primary trap vaccine uh, enrolling uh, animals as we speak. So I'll be uh, excited to share that data with you uh, soon. So in summary for this section, for testing a homegrown malaria vaccine, we're able to use the non-human primate model to show that the Plasmodium falciparum version of the prime and trap vaccine was immunogenic and was able to induce the desired CD8 T cell response in non-human primates. And if we used a multi-antigen version in the null side model and performed a vaccination and challenge study, we were able to achieve sterile protection in one animal, which was a good start. However, uh, we, like many other folks, um, have seen that uh, when you take a vaccine from a mouse to a monkey, you do need a fair amount of optimization. And so we're in that optimization process now, um, and they were hoping with a few more vaccine tweaks, um, we'll be able to improve the immunogenicity and efficacy of this vaccine in the non-human primate model, and hopefully advance it soon to humans. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about cultivating partnerships. So we haven't done uh, this work alone. So in the last five years, we've been able to develop a range of really beneficial partnerships with academic and industry collaborators. And so some of our prominent collaborators are shown here and they span many different areas. So we have collaborators who are providing uh, vaccines, either live attenuated vaccines or subunit or nanoparticle vaccines. We also have a group that is providing vaccine adjuvants that we're able to use to try and improve the um, immunogenicity and efficacy of, of both of these strategies. We are also doing systems immunology work. So the immunological readouts that I've shown you so far have been um, pretty uh, standard, I would say, um, sort of low, lower throughput uh, cellular assays. Uh, but we're looking to do more single cell technologies, to do more omics, um, and to link uh, the, the immunogenicity outcomes with efficacy outcomes in a similar way to what is done in controlled human malaria infection studies. 
And so we're building wonderful partnerships that will be able to help us with that uh, systems immunology data. And then finally, uh, we want to make sure that we design rigorous experiments and that we apply appropriate statistical tests. Uh, and so we have excellent support from a biostatistics team at the Fred Hutch. Finally, I want to talk about the area that I've really been focusing on of late, which is developing improved non-human primate models. So all of the work that I have shown you to date um, has been performed using naive adult animals. And this is very reasonable because most of the work in the literature has been done with naive adult animals. Uh, but infants and children living in endemic areas are the target population for malaria vaccines. And in many ways, naive adult animals are probably not the best to model this target population. And so if we think of infants and children in endemic areas, we see that uh, after birth, they tend to be protected from malaria by virtue of maternal antibodies. If their mother was exposed, she will have antibodies and she can pass them on through the placenta or the breast milk and provide a short window of protection for that infant. But then as that protection wanes uh, and the infant grows older, um, they start experiencing bouts of malaria. And if they survive those bouts of malaria, they are able to develop eventually um, some level of clinical immunity. It means they don't, uh, they're less, less at risk of death. They will uh, still have malaria infections, but they are less likely to suffer those severe outcomes. And then alongside this, this uh, changing malaria exposure, um, the infant immune system is also developing uh, as part of the normal development of the immune system across the lifespan. So there's infant immune system development and there's cumulative exposure. And these things are really not being modeled with our existing naive adult macaques. And so I want to find better ways to use the non-human primate model to study these features that we know are important for malaria in the field. And so I've been working to develop an infant pigtail macaque model uh, for these same types of immunogenicity and efficacy studies. Very surprisingly, uh, there hasn't been a lot of work in infant macaques in the past, um, perhaps because they're a little bit more challenging to handle or perhaps because uh, they permit smaller volumes of, of blood sampling. Um, but whatever the reason, um, there really hasn't been a lot done. So something to do first was just to see if we could adapt the methods and the foundations that we built in the adults to a group of uh, small infants aged about six months, which is the time when they wean. And so again, we designed some very simple experiments, taking naive infant macaques, challenging them with 2,500 plasmodium null zysporozoites, and monitoring the time to infection using our now standard methods. So we did this in pigtail macaques. Uh, by this point in our program, we had done equivalent challenge studies in about 18 adults, um, and we'd gotten the cooperative sampling and diagnosis and drug cure nailed down. And very encouragingly, we're able to uh, do exactly the same things in these infant macaques. We'd see a similar time to infection. They we're actually very good at permitting cooperative sampling. They were really eager to be trained and very food motivated. Um, and uh, we're able to monitor them and, and drug cure them really effectively. So that was excellent um, preliminary data. And so um, this has led to the uh, funded R21 effort that I'm leading um, to compare how age at vaccination um, affects immune uh, how age of vaccination impacts uh, the immunogenicity and efficacy of malaria vaccines um, in uh, both infant and juvenile macaques. Um, and so those studies are taking place uh, beginning at the end of this year and continuing into next year. The other area of interest that I've been developing is to study a previous exposure model. And so for this, I wanted to develop a pigtail macaque model for previous exposure. There is another model uh, for uh, rhesus macaques and, and indeed some other models out there. Um, but because we had now set all these foundations in the pigtail macaque, uh, we wanted to uh, also see if we could do previous exposure in the pigtail macaque. And so for this, uh, we did what we've done in the past, take naive animals, challenge them, monitor them and cure them. But then this time we kept them, we re-enrolled them and we re-challenged them and just repeated that whole thing again. 
And the idea was, we know that in humans, you can have one malaria infection and that won't provide protection against disease. Um, it takes many, many, many exposures in order to develop immunity um, to, to protect against disease. And we wanted to make sure that that was still the case in, in our non-human primate model. And so here we have data um, from our p-tail macaques. Uh, we see naive animals after challenge um, with the 18S RT-PCR diagnostic endpoint, uh, all develop infections on day six, seven, or eight. If we have animals that have experienced an infection, are drug cured, and then re-challenged, um, we did this with three animals, and you can see that all three developed an infection uh, on day six, showing that that single prior infection um, did not change uh, their time to infection or the subsequent infection, mirroring what we know from the human uh, situation. What we also did with this model was to analyze gene expression uh, before, during, and after um, each infection round. And we were very encouraged to see that some of the main trends that have been described in humans uh, were recapitulated in our model. So one thing that we know from humans is that malaria is immunomodulatory and malaria infection can lead to lasting changes in baseline immunity um, that can persist for many months even after the infection is cured. And we saw that in our model. Um, so when we look at differentially expressed genes between our first baseline and our second baseline after drug cure and, and two months after drug cure, uh, we saw over a hundred genes that were differentially expressed. And then when we mapped these to pathways, we saw that these pathways were the same pathways that have been described in humans. So we saw changes in monocytes, neutrophils, cell cycle and inflammatory pathways. Uh, and all of these pathways have been identified as being modulated in humans in response to falciparum malaria infection. We were also uh, able to look at the changes that occur during infection in these animals um, and also to separate it into acute infection just the first few days um, versus infection that's been allowed to continue for a little bit longer um, in the first infection compared to the reinfection. And again, this very closely mapped what had been described in humans where the first acute infection is really dominated by these uh, upregulation of inflammatory signals shown in red here, whereas reinfection um, is uh, associated with the absence of this inflammatory signal. Um, and this is much more similar to what um, is seen in individuals who experience multiple exposures in an endemic setting. So we are very excited about this model um, and we have many plans to uh, use this in the future. Um, and we are funded to use this model through a U01 cooperative research effort um, to study how prior malaria exposure impacts the immune response to vaccines um, in a uh, controlled NHP model system. So in summary, uh, we have preliminary data to support an infant pigtailed macaque model. We have preliminary data to support a new model of prior exposure. Um, and we have funding and exciting plans to use these models uh, in the future. And the goal is really um, to, to have the best model possible so that we can even further increase the chances of our results from non-human primates translating to the population of interest. So uh, future directions, uh, we're gonna try to keep getting better. I uh, believe in continual improvement. So we're going to uh, keep uh, doing what we can. Um, and uh, this may involve decreasing the sampling frequency post-challenge just to minimize the stress on the animals further or to look at other cooperative sampling methods. Uh, we want to expand our testing efforts to other, other novel strategies. So far, I've pre presented the data from our in-house strategy, uh, but we're also involved in many collaborations and those will soon be going into monkeys to test uh, novel formulations and delivery routes. I want to continue to, deepen, to deepen collaborative relationships. Uh, this work um, is hard. <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts and um, having uh, collaborators and uh, advisors to help us make sure we're making really strategic decisions is uh, very important. And uh, it's, we also want to really keep on top of emerging technologies and continue to network with folks who are developing platform immunological analyses uh, 
and to work with them as much as possible. Uh, and then finally, I want to develop even more relevant models. Um, so I've shown you that we have an infant model. I've shown you we have a previous exposure model. We don't yet have them together. So the next goal is to previously expose infants. Um, and then uh, we also want to look at what happens uh, when the mother is previously exposed, since that's another situation that happens uh, in our target population. So I would just like to acknowledge everybody. This is work that involves many folks. Thank you to all of you, um, including the folks at the Washington National Primate Research Center, everyone in the Murphy Lab and uh, Malaria Molecular Diagnostic Lab and our funders. And I will just leave this slide up here um, for uh, you to scan and give me an evaluation uh, while we take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the really cool talk. I had absolutely no idea all this was going on around there. <laughs> right? <laughs> we kind of, you know, we, yes, we're, we do something a little bit different to what most folks in the department do. So um, it is nice to have this opportunity to to share it with you all. Yeah, I th thought I knew every, whatever was going on, but I've been here for 15 years and I didn't know this. Uh, so um, let, let, let me uh, open it up for questions. I'm, I'm sure there's a few. Um, uh, there's one right now, Jordan Jackson, please take, take it over. Hi, um, that was an, a wonderful presentation. Oh, sorry, to get my camera up. There we go. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, so thank you for, for coming in and giving that talk. Um, I, I wanted to get your opinion on, um, obviously, um, you know, uh, non-human primate research is a bit controversial. Um, and so I wanted to, I, I think that the, the approach that you're taking to these studies is, you know, relatively non-invasive. Um, and I, I'm really enjoying that about this uh, project, but I did want to get your um, sort of take on non-human primate uh, studies in general um, and where you think the future of that uh, field of study will go. That is a great uh, question. And it's something that I consider pretty frequently um, since, you know, I've chosen this as a, as a career direction. Um, I think that, um, the controversy is important. I think that we should have discussion about the merit of the work and that we should uh, make sure that we continually strive to do it ethically and to do it in a way that is most likely to be scientifically valuable. Um, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the long, long term, right? So, you know, it's only just been... I think 10 years since there was the moratorium on chimp research in the US. And so that was a change in the research landscape. Um, I could imagine that there might be in the future, you know, restrictions on the use of even macaques for research and perhaps um, shifting towards um, other smaller non-human primates that are a little less sentient or um, perceived as less sentient um, or even away from non-human primates uh, overall. I. I don't know what's going to happen, but um, currently, uh, this is currently this is having non-human primate data in your uh, clinical trial packet is seen as as a positive. So at the moment, it continues to uh, to support advancing vaccines into the clinic, um, and as long as that continues to be true, I'm going to want to continue to work in this space. Thanks. Uh, so Larry True uh, indicated he had a question. Mel Melanie, I, I thought that was a wonderful presentation. I'm a anatomic pathologist, so I have no direct communication, but I think your talk just is a testimony to um, the diversity of what we're doing in our combined department. And I have an anecdote. Previous to training in pathology, I worked a couple of years in Nepal, where, of course, in, uh, malaria is endemic. And I got somewhat involved with the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. At that time, more than 30 years ago, developing a vaccine was a goal, and it seemed nearly developed, but in, still, it never occurred. So the challenge continues. Uh, I'm really glad to get the update. Thank you. Are there, uh, are there any other questions? It might so, be someone so, in the chat or oh uh no uh, that was that was Larry. Um 
uh, well, I had a question actually. So, so what what is what is the vaccine against? Like, what is is there like a particular epitope, and and are there so you know? Is there a way to engineer it, or how common or or how similar are the different um, parasites? So you could maybe aim to have a universal uh, vaccine. Um, I think you've you summed up the outcome of decades of research, which is uh, <laughs> uh, it's challenging to have a single antigen vaccine um, that will provide high level protection against diverse field strains. Um, so the vaccine that we have, RTSS, um, is based on a single antigen, the circumsporozoite protein or CSP. That's the uh, antigen that I was describing in our prime and trap studies as well. Um, and it is highly variable amongst different strains. And so that could be part of the reason why it has relatively low efficacy. Uh, and so current efforts to develop a next generation vaccine are really focusing on using multiple antigens or using multiple copies of the same antigen um, to try and develop um, a multi-strain <laughs> falciparum vaccine initially, and then to develop a multi-species vaccine to cover all of the human malaria infectious species. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, Erica, take it away. Yeah, hi, Melanie, that was a fantastic presentation. And so clearly each, each step was presented so clearly. And, and I do wanna say, I'm really impressed by that cooperative method that you're using for, for getting blood. I mean, I think, I mean, it, it, it speaks to um, the humanity of this project. You know, I, I know we're trying to reduce the use of non-human primates, but, but, I, but I think you've really um, worked out a way to, um, to get blood in a, in a very, very humane way. And also your discussion of the cure that you're presenting so that the animals are happy and, you know, with what they're eating. I don't know. I just, I just want to say kudos for, for the, for the great efforts you've gone to and the success that you've met in that area. Thank you. Yeah. It's, um, I have to give a lot of credit for the cooperative sampling to the behavioral management team at the primate center. So there are a group of, uh, primate behavioralists who, whose job is to um, work with the animals and facilitate getting the animals to do what we want them to do by themselves. Um, and so uh, they're really uh, responsible for, for making that happen. And uh, uh, so, yes, they get the majority of the credit. But um, thank you for saying that. Um, and then, yes, with regard to the drug cure, um, yeah, there, we want to make it as easy as possible. So um, we're, we're really happy we found something that is quick and tasty and well tolerated and works in all animals and even the little ones. Shihiro, go ahead. Hi, Melanie. That was a great talk. Um, I had a question. I was just curious in that last model that you showed, um, you know, later on you, you showed that there's a preponderance of a like sort of a monocytic response and I wondered if you could unpack that and sort of in terms of a you know immune response what does that mean uh hmm. so briefly I can't unpack that too much because the data was bulk seek um so we don't have uh cell like single cell level data um to go into any more detail um but this was, you know, preliminary data for a larger grant where we are hopefully going to be able to unpack that a little bit more. Um, but um, what has been described in humans is that the monocytes are changed epigenetically um, and it, they have a persistently uh, changed state um, where they're less um, likely to persist in antigen, antigen presentation. Uh, so it can influence not only how the monocytes deal with a subsequent infection, but also how they might deal with vaccination. Are they immunosuppressive in any way, you think? Yes, yeah. So malaria is variously described as being immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory. Um, and there are several mechanisms that could contribute to that. Um, there is active manipulation by secreted factors that mimic uh, host cytokines and, and signaling molecules. Um, the hemozoan molecule that the parasite produces in the blood stage um, can be very detrimental to um, the monocytes and dendritic cells and alter their function. Um, there is the physical interaction of the parasites in the spleen uh, that probably changes um, the splenic architecture and, and things. Um, so there's, there's lots of different things that the parasite is doing to prevent 
our bodies from effectively combating it. And it probably involves multiple different cell types and multiple different mechanisms. But uh, inflammation and changes in monocytes and changes in antigen presentation have been described. Um, and we're going to be looking for those same things um, in our studies moving forwards. Thank you. So we're we're a little over, but if there's a, another question, well, we can do one more if if anybody has one. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll call it good. Going once, going twice. All right. Well, thank you again for giving a talk. It was that was an exceptionally good talk. I. I learned a lot. I didn't know I knew so little about uh, malaria. Well, thank so, you. And if you want to follow up, um, you know, please shoot me an email. You know, thank you again and, uh, and, and best of luck on, on your R21. Thank you. Right. Bye. 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 Thanks all for your questions. <laughs>